So I'll pass over to Ayajit Nanda for today's talk about happy rebirth day to Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, thank you, Derek. <laughs> yeah, um, I think maybe we'll just start with meditation first, yeah? So I don't know, you all probably don't wanna hear another introduction from me. <laughs> Santa Cruz Mountains, Karuna Buddhist Vihara. That's it. Okay, so why don't we all just kind of settle in for some meditation time and take a few deep breaths. Come into our bodies and feel where our body is touching our chairs or our cushions. You can do some standing meditation or walking if you like during this time too really feeling our contact with, with the earth. And recently, I've been enjoying the um, Anguttara Nikaya Sutta about the six recollections. So I thought we could meditate on that today. And we'll start with the recollection of the Buddha. And we bring to mind our connection with him as our teacher. We reflect on this pure and perfectly enlightened being. Impeccable in conduct and understanding as the chanting goes. How much the Buddha understood about the world and the universe, the way things work. and how his conduct was, never doing anything out of great hatred or delusion, always upright and kind and appropriate for whatever situation, having that wisdom. his accomplishments and understanding the Dhamma and its complete completeness and its entirety. And as the chanting goes, the knower of the worlds, all of the different realms in Sangsara, heaven realms and the hell realms, human and animal. Understanding how much, um, how we're not alone in this universe or other universes. How amazing it is that he knew all of this and now science is coming into alignment and agreeing with him. really feeling the awesomeness, how much awe one can have seeing what's out there now and looking at the Buddha and seeing that he knew all of it. He knew about all of it. And also as the chanting goes, the perfect trainer of those who wish to be trained. So how amazing it is that the Buddha with all of this knowledge and understanding, out of compassion and wisdom would help us for so long, so much of his life, spend the time and effort training us 
helping us to see what we need to do in order to free ourselves. And in the suttas, we see him giving advice to specific people for different situations and different levels of understanding. How lucky we are to have such a perfect teacher. And not just us, but the devas too. How he could help heavenly beings train and also awaken because they're in realms that are also not permanent. And also as the chanting goes, he is awake and holy, awake to the whole of the Dhamma, seeing it all and seeing what really matters for us to free ourselves. really feeling into the gravitas of this. The gravitas and the gratitude that we can have for it. And the second recollection is the Dhamma. How well the Buddha explained it to us. How apparent here and now it is. And timeless, even after more than a millennia, a few thousand years, it's still relevant here and now. Encouraging us to look deeply into our experience and investigate the reality we're facing, where we're caught up, where we need to work to free ourselves. And as the sutta goes to be experienced individually by the wise, We experience the truth of the Dhamma taught to us by the Buddha. See it for ourselves. We experience the truth of impermanence and not self as we see the dukkha in our lives and in the world. And we experience this ourselves. No one can do it for us. We have to do it.
And we have to learn to use it to help us let go. Let go of all of our clinging and remove our own ignorance. And then the third recollection is the rec recollection of the enlightened Sangha. The blessed one's disciples who have practiced well, who have practiced directly experiencing the Dhamma for themselves, gaining insight and having integrity in their practice being honest with themselves and seeing through their defilements. Being diligent. We too can have the same diligence and integrity as the enlightened Sangha. Looking at them as living examples of our haunts, people who have really removed all, all of their defiles. Letting go of all of their attachments to the world. Such ones are worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect. And they give occasion for incomparable goodness to arise in the world. And they exist right now in this time, in this world. And taking encouragement in the enlightened Sangha here and now for us to be able to follow them and free ourselves.
And then the fourth recollection is recollection of our own generosity. And looking back at the times when we've been generous, whether it's to the Sangha or some other uh, big, big ways of being generous in our lives. But also looking at the smaller things. Often we can tend to undervalue our own generosity or think that we're not, not a very generous person or somewhat feeling um, stingy or small in some way. But somewhere in our lives, we've all been generous and we can look for those instances. And we're encouraged to look at these small things too. Even if it's just like, Holding a door open for someone as a form of generosity or sharing some food with a friend if you're going out to eat and you're enjoying what you're eating. It's just, oh, have some too, you know, enjoy this. Small things, they also help us. They can also bring us joy. Empathetic words to a coworker, acquaintance, if you notice they're feeling down or something's happening for them. All our small acts that we can do as a gift, as Ajahn Gunha encourages, make everything a gift. We can look back at things we've done and see that they were gifts, they were acts of generosity of heart or time, kind words. Really feeling into that joy that we have, not in an ego puffing kind of way, but really seeing that this is good. It's good for the people you're helping, the people who are receiving the generosity, and it's good for your own heart and not to dismiss even the small things. Something we might think is a small thing may have a bigger impact on somebody than we would ever know. Even sending metta can be an act of generosity. And then the fifth recollection is the recollection of our virtue, or sila. And we can go down the list of our precepts and check off which ones we've kept well today. I didn't kill or harm any living beings physically. I didn't take what was not given didn't commit sexual misconduct. I didn't lie or consume any intoxicants today. And we stay focused on the precepts that we didn't break instead of reminding ourselves of the ones that we could have been better about. 
Now's the time to look at our own goodness, our own kindness, our own harmlessness. And we can feel relieved and joyful about it. And the relief and joy can bring out deeper states. Moving into that feeling of PT, maybe Sukha. And then the sixth recollection is the recollection of the devas. And that might feel a little um, unfamiliar to us, maybe, to think of the devas. But there are other heavenly beings who have passed away from this realm. And when they were reborn, they were reborn in the heavenly realms because of their faith or confidence in the triple gem. Their confidence in their sila. Their learning of the Dhamma. Their generosity and their wisdom. These qualities have the ability to help us to be reborn in heavenly realms, in better places where we can practice. And the Buddha encourages us to think, I too have that same kind of confidence, that same kind of sila and learning of the Dhamma, the same kind of generosity and wisdom as the devas, to whatever extent this might be true for ourselves. Taking in our own goodness. And honest with ourselves that we do have a lot of goodness. We have to have in order to be able to be here meditating together, spending our time on Dhamma instead of anything else.
And here on Ajahn Brahm's birthday, we can recollect his positive qualities, his deva-like qualities. And we can think of his good sila and generosity with his time and energy and all of his insightful teachings that we've benefited from. And we can think of his humility, spending time with him at the monastery. It's very clear that he's a very humble being and also very kind, selfless, with an incredible ability to let go, not, not holding on to anything. And we can think of his wisdom and compassion and his monk's life being well lived, really worthy of honoring and supporting. And we can reflect on where our own good qualities might be similar to Ajahn Brahms. See where we're um, similar and encourage that putting word in. More wisdom, more compassion, more kindness more letting go, starting wherever we are, being sure to recognize that we do have these good qualities. Appreciating that we have good teachers to help us grow. Feeling into that joy of having Kali and Amita who are further along than we are and able to help us. Having the feeling, bringing up the feeling of letting go into that joy. Fully immersing ourselves in it. Relief and joy and not clinging.
<laughs> okay, so as most of you probably know, um, today's Ajahn Brahm's birthday, and you might have noticed from the meditation that I have a lot of gratitude and appreciation for him as a, my teacher, one of my teachers, and I have a photo of him on my shrine in, in the Kuti I'm staying in, and every day I look at it and it makes me smile really giant smile <laughs> lights up in the morning um yeah i find it very inspiring his his sweet energy his kindness so happy birthday to ajahn brahm <laughs> um and i said um when i was at his monastery once it happened to be during his birth he wanted and he said basically the best gift to give him was um, just practicing and making progress on the path and following his good advice. So, yep, today we meditated together and we're going to share some Dhamma now. So we can dedicate the merit of it to our um, our teacher, Ajahn Brahm, as his present. <laughs> and yeah, I, I hope I hope this is his last birthday, rebirthday. <laughs> I hope he's not coming back after this lifetime. That'd be nice. <laughs> And how do we make it our last rebirth day, our last rebirth? So, yeah, what's the? I've been I've been on this theme of um, we taught a retreat a couple months ago uh, up in Washington State at this retreat center, and it occurred to me, oh, this sutta is about rebirth control. Yeah, so I've been on this rebirth control kick for a while, and I'm enjoying the thought of it. <laughs> yeah, rebirth control. Yeah. <laughs> So the first thing that comes to my mind, of course, is uh, having really good sila, especially with the, the idea of the kamapata as a guide. And it's like the, the 10 wholesome and unwholesome actions that you probably heard me talk about before if you've been coming to anything I've taught about. So <laughs> it's, um, yeah, the sutta for it is Majima 41. It's the Salayaka Sutta. And it's really nice in there because he does talk about the devas being reborn in heavenly realms. How if we keep the um, ten kamapata, which it's it's an expansion of the five precepts. So it's of course not killing or or taking what's not given and avoiding sexual misconduct and um, avoiding false, divisive, offensive, or harsh speech and and avoiding gossip and useless speech, and then abstaining from covetousness, um, swapping out ill will for metta and having right view instead of wrong view. So if, if you are keeping up with these things and um, also practicing to deepen your, your meditation to, as well and increase your wisdom, then the Buddha says you can choose where you go after death. So it's kind of nice. You can set your mind on which particular heaven realm you would like to reborn into to be reborn into or you can um someone on the retreat brought this up you can decide like okay just whichever one is going to help me make the most progress that one <laughs> and i like that idea i think the buddha would approve just stay more open and and not be kind of um clinging to some particular heaven realm so that's good or not be reborn at all <laughs> so this is great rebirth control and um let's see there was another story I wanted to tell and I can't remember. Um, anyway, don't be reborn. That's the best option. <laughs> so we should always have Nibbana as our real goal. And whether we're lay or monastic, it's, it's important to not write yourself off if you're not an ordained member of the Sangha. So we had a friend who um, really wants to practice for Nibbana in this lifetime, but they heard that um, there's this commentarial quote about if if you become an arahant as a lay person you're either gonna die pretty much immediately or you're gonna have to ordain as a monastic and again commentary <laughs> not really the buddha talking <laughs> but the idea is that you'll be so changed and inspired that um something big will have to change in your life or you won't want to live basically you want to give up the life force if you can't find a monastery to join so um, 
their their concern is that they have a partner who's ill and they want to fulfill their obligation to their partner and be their caregiver as long as they need them. So, so they're wondering, should I not be aiming for an Ibana? And we're like, no, <laughs> aim for an Ibana. Because I, I strongly believe that no matter our life circumstances, like if we have the desire to realize an Ibana, we should go for it as best we can, no matter what our current position is. And I, I do trust that um, the Dhamma will unfold if we if we do realign, realize Nibbana, like something will happen that will help us keep our our commitments fulfilled and also be able to um, not have any greed, hatred or delusion or cling. So yeah, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Don't hold back. <laughs> and yeah, I assume that once once we're enlightened, we'll have enough wisdom and compassion to know what the right thing to do is in our specific situations and the Dhamma will come through for us. So yeah, that much the comma of reaching any state of enlightenment, whichever stage, yeah, that purity and the comma of it will impact our lives in ways that we probably won't even consciously try to figure out ahead of time or after after the fact too, things will just happen. So don't, don't not try your best for Nibbana. <laughs> no rebirth. <laughs> so um, another, another thing I've been thinking about lately in terms of like rebirth control methods is examining dependent origination. So for the Vasa, I decided to do the Sangyuta Nikaya, try to go through the whole thing cover to cover. And I'm in the section on the um, dependent origination. And I'm, I'm really encouraged that even though there's like 12 links and there's different places in there that the Buddha talks about ending, it's mostly just ignorance, <laughs> removing ignorance and working with clinging basically. So, um, dependent origination is of course, this really important, deep, very involved topic to get into. And it's, it's kind of intimidating, there's that story about um, Venerable Ananda saying to the Buddha, oh, it's just dependent origination is just like crystal clear to me right now. It's just so amazing and so clear. And the Buddha's like, whoa, <laughs> don't say it's simple and easy and clear because this is really deep. And basically, um, you have to be a stream enterer to really have deep insight and understanding, real understanding of it, not just intellectual Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear. Can you hear that? So distracting, rattly. <laughs> 14 foot trailer bed going by. Sorry. I'm just going to wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Off grid mountain life. Yep. We got a lot of those trailers around. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, um, not being a stream mentor myself, I can't, I can't say I have really deep insight into it. I own intellectual understanding, but again, I feel really, um, relieved in a way to think that the places that we need to work on it are, um, pretty much just around removing the ignorance and we can see parts in the chain that we can see a little bit clearer and we have a little bit more Mm -hmm. wiggle room to work with in our own practice. So my favorite part, I think the part I can see most clearly in my mind when it is happening is like between the craving and the clinging. So when there's feeling and craving, those are really immediate. And sometimes you'll hear um, ideas from other places about being able to like cut the chain between feeling and craving. But the Buddha, I don't think was necessarily pointing at that. Um, as the idea with dependent origination, like cutting the chain, it was more describing how the process of dependent origination works, how one thing is dependent on another. And so sometimes you'll hear about cutting the chain between feeling and craving. And for me, that's so immediate. There's this pleasant feeling and I'm like, Ooh, you know, it's, it's almost immediate. <laughs> and so I'm more into looking at 
between the, the craving and the clinging and where I can have enough mindfulness to pull back from further going into that craving with the clinging. Um, maybe I'll just run through really quick for those who aren't that familiar with the 12 links of dependent origination. And oh, Ajahn Brahm has a really good essay that Bhikkhu Bodhi said he really appreciated. Um, you can find it on Sutta Central. I have it up. Um, would anybody, is anybody interested in reading about dependent origination? I can stick it in the chat. Yeah, okay. It's a really good paper. I, I, I was enjoying it a lot. Let me see how to... Ah, uh, okay, here. Yeah. Yep. I think it's a really good topic to get into for yourselves. Um, if you have the interest, even if <laughs> even if nobody else is a stream enter like me, I don't know. <laughs> it's nice to have the intellectual understanding. Okay. Yeah. Did it go? I'm very not techie. Uh, okay. Oh, that's nice to know. Thanks, Minori. Ajahn Brahmali has a booklet too with a bit more advanced content. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let me move away from that. Okay, so just to run through it real quick in case anybody's not that familiar. Um, it's, it's, it kind of starts and ends. It's a little cyclic, right? <laughs> it starts with ignorance and then volitional formations. Um, consciousness, name and form, or sometimes they call it mentality and materiality, which I kind of like a little bit better because I can wrap my head around it a little more. Um, six sense bases, contact, feeling, bringing existence, or or I like I like becoming feels more um, active in a way somehow, <laughs> and then birth, aging, and death. So just to hear them run through, it's kind of like, huh? <laughs> it's a little baffling. <laughs> but um, again, all we really need to do is remove the ignorance. Um, and that that happens with our ship, of course, the most completely, but we can work on it in the meantime. And um, really, I think this, this sutta gets undersold quite a bit. The one about, um, sometimes they call it like transcendental dependent origination or or dependent arising as a sutta. And this is the one that was, is kind of, uh, as Ajahn Brahm, I think he mentions in his essay, it's been a little while, but um, he's talking about, I like, this is the one that we really use to work with. We're not like cutting the chain of dependent arising so much as using the transcendental dependent arising um, to help us get out of samsara. And so it's Upanisa Sutta. It's in the Sangyutta too, in the same section about dependent arising. It's like um, 12.3 and it's like the 23rd one in there. So you can dig around. I can put a link maybe. I had it pulled up earlier. Stick a link in there in case you want to look at it too. I don't know. Is anyone interested? I'm into the links today, I guess. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Adrian likes it. I'll go with that. <laughs> I can see his head. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Stick that in there. But yeah, so from a, it, it feels a little more practical for the rebirth, rebirth control. So you start off with, um, you see suffering. That's pretty apparent to a lot of us in at whatever level, in whatever case. It's like, ooh, yeah, suffering. But that suffering gives rise to faith or confidence that the Buddha knew what he was talking about. It's like, huh, yeah, okay, <laughs> see where this is going. And then that that confidence makes us happy. It leads to pamoja, which is the Pali word for happiness or joy. It's not one of the usual ones that we hear that much about, but I like it. <laughs> Different kind of happiness or joy. And that leads to PT or rapture, as sometimes they translate it. And then PT leads to tranquility or pisati. And then the tranquility leads to sukha. Um, I like the translation of bliss. So the, the tranquility leads to bliss. 
And then the bliss leads to samadhi or stillness. And that leads to yata bhutanyana dasana. So it's like the, the insight, knowledge, and understanding, not just the intellectual, but gained through our practice, the insight kind of knowledge. And that leads to um, nimida or uh, disillusionment. I like disillusionment as a translation. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's kind of... Um, uh, like the word glamour, like the original meaning of the word glamour is, is like, a, like you, you, you cast them also this glamour and it's like you're seeing through this. You're not under this spell anymore with this nibida. You're disillusioned from the spell of the world, basically, like the illusion that things are nice and good and there's not suffering. <laughs> so that, that disillusionment leads to dispassion or viraga. And that leads to the um, basically enlightenment experience. We move to your freedom. And from that, you have the understanding of your own enlightenment, the knowledge that you've reached the end of your, your suffering and the end of your path. So no more rebirth. So best rebirth control ever. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the whole of the Eightfold Path is included in all of this. So... The Buddha was really complete and everything kind of fits together very well if you look at it. So I also find that very encouraging. And I think, um, as you all know, I probably talked more than I usually ever do. <laughs> so I'm happy to open it up for questions or comments or uh, confusing, confusing looks. That's okay too. <laughs> Thank you, Aya. The first question has come in the chat already, if you may. may yeah. yeah, disenchantment. Yeah, I like it too, Shirley. I think it's good. It's the idea of that we're enchanted with this world. It's like we like it, you know, it's like um, we like being under this spell. We like the, the charm and the pleasant things about it. I'm sitting outside right now, extremely comfortable temperatures, nice little light breeze shady i can hear the creek running it's like ooh, all this nice sensual input and one could easily just be like yep i just want to be a mountain woman next time again i just want to live here and enjoy this and not seeing through <laughs> any of the dukkha that's around <laughs> we got a like a hive of yellow jackets that just stung a guest yesterday and got a lot of mosquitoes out now too and we've got um it's drought time here in California, as maybe some of you have heard, and our, our spring has dried up for the year as it does, but about a month sooner than usual. So yeah, <laughs> got to look at the big picture and not just get stuck in the enchantment. Yep, like it. Thanks, Shirley. <laughs> I'm kind of curious how people, um, what people thought of the meditation earlier. Have you heard those recollections before? Pretty much? No, not really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I've really been uh, um, enjoying this meditation. And I don't usually, I, I've been looking for recordings online. So if anybody's heard it online from somebody else that, I could use. <laughs> I'd appreciate it. <laughs> it's kind of nice to be led through things sometimes instead of chewing on it ourselves. <laughs> Shirley's got her hand up. <laughs> Hi, yes. Thank you for that meditation. Um, <clears throat> I know that it's one of the, uh, I, we covered some of those those meditations on one of our retreats mm -hmm. uh, and I think am I right there on one of the causes these meditations are also another approximate cause for Pamoja the bringing, I'm sure it says that somewhere in the sutras but yeah. what fascinated me was that you covered all six oh. <laughs> and I've never there's only one other um, that 
I, I don't know whether you've come across Arjun Achalo, who lives in Thailand. Mm -hmm. And he's done a guided, long time ago, he did a guided meditation on Devanusati, which I mm -hmm. think can be found on, 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 on online somewhere. Not on YouTube, I think it's on his, uh, maybe on his um, website. Okay. But it's very unusual. It's the only one I've found. So the others, that's the, the only the second time in my life I've been able, privileged to do Deva Nusati. Because it, it is intense not to be make no sense. I don't know whether this is because people feel that Westerners are allergic to it, Davis. Sure. I don't know, but thank you. <laughs> okay. So I'm sorry. I I, I'm having trouble hearing. Our internet is a little bit flaky out here, and I didn't catch the middle chunk of what you said before you said devas. You said it's unusual to cover it all. To then... cover all six. Um, um, yes. And um, as I said, <clears throat> the only other time I've done a meditation on Deva Nusati was mm -hmm. this guided meditation that Ajahn Achalo has online. So this is the second time I've been privileged to do a guided meditation on Deva Nusati, and I just wanted to thank you. Ah, oh, thank you, Shirley. Because it's yeah. unusual, and I don't know why. I don't know why this isn't done. Maybe because people think Western. I don't know whether it's done in Asia, but maybe people don't think people don't like to think about Devas. I don't know why it's not done, but I'm glad you did it. Yeah, thank you. I I think you're probably right, Shirley. I mean, in Asia, a lot of people are sensitive and aware of ghosts and things. Like they're they're afraid of spirits and they like have run-ins with them. You know, it's it's kind of a thing. So I think that kind of contact with other worlds leaves them more open to contact with the Deva worlds as well. And so they're more like open-minded about it, maybe. I don't know. Um, I grew up with a lot of ghost stories myself, so <laughs> I feel like, hey, if there are if there are realms or ghost realms, of course there are deva realms, and I kind of have a feeling that in this forest there are quite a, a quite a lot of devas. It feels like some old old growth trees, and the energy is very strong. And so, why not those tree devas that show up in the suttas? You know, I Absolutely. I have no reason to doubt. The Buddha was right about so many other things. Why not this? <laughs> I, I do have one yeah. question that I've just thought of, which is, does do these six reflections appear in the suttas or is it from the Visuddhi Magga? Mm -hmm. No, this is the one I, I used is from Anguttara 1111, I think. Let me double check that real quick. I'm pretty sure. I think I saved it somewhere because I like, yeah, it's 11, 11. So, um, and I think, I think there might be a couple similar ones sprinkled here and there. So it's, it's the Buddha talking, not someone else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm having a little trouble with my internet. Um, and it, it might partly be because there's a board meeting going on uh, in the shrine room right now. Opposed to me turning off my video. Is that depressing? Everybody knows what I look like. It can go oh. left. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to see if this helps because I'm having trouble hearing um, the comments and questions. And I'd rather, I'd rather hear, make sure I can catch it all. Anybody opposed? No? Okay. Have a go. And then I will unmute Rob for the next okay. question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hello, thank you. Um, yeah, I've just got, um, I was just wondering if you might comment on um, or give your advice on lay people of leading busy lives and how mm -hmm. to get the right balance between kind of learning about the theoretical side of Buddhism and, and the actual practice side and where that kind of, where, where the priorities you think Mm -hmm. within that yeah I think it's it's good to have basic knowledge of of practice of Buddhism uh, concepts and and um, doctrine the real focus should be on actual practice 
And I, I'm sure that um, as you deepen, you'll have more understanding and want to read more and look more at it. But it's always it always boils down back to the basics. So if you always come back to the basics in your life, um, that should help. And just coming back to the Four Noble Truths, coming back to looking at impermanence, not self, and dukkha, um, dissatisfactoriness in our lives, kind of coming back to just basic meditation on the breath and, and developing deeply into that, um, increasing our samadhi. I think that's a good place to start and enough. And as we keep going, we'll get deeper and deeper into it naturally. We don't have to try too hard to push um, learning and and a lot of conceptualization sometimes is not as important. And I, I don't personally um, want to get too sucked down into certain things myself. So sticking to the suttas and sticking to the basics are where I think the most practical progress can be made. Mm. Thanks. That's the answer I was looking for. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I passed the quiz test. Yes. Yay! <laughs> Hi, Minori. Right. This is um, this is a question on something that um, you mentioned, Aya, in uh, earlier in your talk. Uh, uh, it is you told that, like you know, when you 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 set your mind to uh, be born in a, a heavenly realm so you can practice better mm -hmm. uh, if you if you kind of don't attend Nibbana. Mm -hmm. So I, I've heard uh, about it a um, lot from, especially from Sri Lankan monks and all. And then I've heard this uh, talk about, you know, setting your mind in things like, uh, you know, to sit a heavenly uh, uh, you know, a board so where there are a lot of stream enterers and there's a Dhamma talks happening. But mm -hmm. say, if you're not a stream enterer and your mind kind of scatters, and do you want to go to a heavenly realm and then see all these lovely things and get distracted? Isn't it better to, um, uh, you know, set your mind in a path like you or uh, Venerable Chanda in the next life, at least if you can't do this, and next time, you know, roll up the sleeves and try your best in that day. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think the Buddha was necessarily recommending to do this, to set your mind on a heavenly realm per se. He's saying you can. If you have the desire to do it and you have enough um, sila and uh, sort of insight and practice under your belt, it's possible to, and you could make progress in those other realms. But I, he, I'm sure that Nibbana is always the goal and you don't really necessarily want to be reborn in a heaven realm where you're too sucked into the pleasures <laughs> and not, not seeing them enough um your stories in the suttas about realms where the buddha talks to the beings there or they come to see him they visit from those realms and talk to the buddha so it's still possible but um i i kind of agree with you i i would want to set my mind on where am i going to make the best progress and just leave that open and not worry about some tusita realm or hey the yama devas sound really nice let's go hang out with them or something like that you know it's like setting your intention on awakening and wherever the best place for that is the best place for making progress is so good point <laughs> yeah Next question is from Anne. Hi there. Thank, thank you for a very interesting talk and meditation. I, just an observation in some ways that the sense of self seems so powerfully strong 
and so enticing at times. And I just wondered if you had any useful tips to help mm-hmm. um, hold that sense of self skillfully. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think seeing it already, like like uh, noticing that strong sense of self mm-hmm. coming up is already a big step forward in the right direction like okay. having having the observation of yeah there's that sense of self rising up and I like to do um sort of more body-centered work with it so I notice where I feel it strongest usually I feel it kind of in the center of my chest sometimes I feel it kind of a little higher in the shoulders like a bit of a, a puffing up or a kind of a clamping down feeling, sort of a mm-hmm. contracting feeling. And, mm-hmm. and it's um, uncomfortable and noticing the unpleasantness of that mm-hmm. feeling, the mm-hmm. physical feeling of it and physically kind of scrunching myself up and then completely relaxing and letting go mm-hmm. physically with my muscles, kind of, I'm going to turn my video on for fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I kind of like actually like contract around yeah. it as hard as I can and then like completely you no know? okay. and that that physical feeling of letting go helps okay. me and kind of mentally let go okay. too and the more you can observe it the better it is because okay. the more it's in your face the more you're going to get disgusted with it <laughs> and the more you'll want to turn away from that yeah like encouraging that feeling from arising <laughs> okay. yes thank you thank you um, I remember Many, many years ago, when I first started, I was doing a chant at Chitsas Buddhist Monastery about realizing Nibbana, and, and, I, and I stopped chanting at that point because I thought, oh, no, if I do that, I'll have to lose my sense of self. Mm-hmm. That kind of powerful, and I think that still lingers a bit, so I will try a bit more on the body work. Thank you very much. Okay, good luck, Anne. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe in you, Anne. <laughs> okay. I miss Venerable Chanda. She's also very encouraging and positive. <laughs> I think of her. <laughs> yeah. If somebody is listening to this video later after this talk, then we have a link for the Deva Nusati meditation, which is, it can be found on www.peacebeyondsuffering.org or ah. collection 09.html. Oh, okay, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. I remember that Venerable Chanda did in the last retreat do some meditations on each of these different types of recollections, one Mm -hmm. session per recollection. But it's the first time I've ever heard it done all in one meditation. So it's really nice to have that. Thank you. (laughs) Hope it wasn't too much. (laughs) Cram it all in. (laughs) Looks like Rob's got his hand up too. Right. Sorry, Rob. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Back again. Um, yeah, it was just something that crossed my mind then when um, I think uh, someone, Anne, was talking about um, non-self, I think. Uh, I was just wondering whether you could offer any advice on how to start making that crossover from getting serenity and meditation to um, getting more insights on the, on the three characteristics. Mm-hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think when you've got enough serenity going and your mind feels stable enough to do the investigation, it's really, I think, helpful for, at least for me to uh, look for that sense of self and try to deconstruct it a bit. See like, what, what am I calling myself? Where do I feel the sense of self? What does it feel like? Um, 
where, where is it that I'm clinging to this sense of self? Looking at like survival instincts and mechanisms and what is it that feels threatened perhaps or what is it that uh, needs what needs something what feels like it needs something and trying to find that sense of self and seeing that you can't really do it <laughs> it's not a permanent um, lasting kind of entity or feeling so just doing investigation when you've got enough enough um, samadhi going on that you're actually able to um, deeply contemplate and investigate. And it works the same with impermanence, um, reflecting on things. Your body is a great reflection for impermanence. Looking at, yeah, five years ago, it wasn't like this, or, you know, 30 years ago, it wasn't like this. Um, and it won't be in the future either. Looking forward to, I will age, I will die. Those types of reflections can be useful. Um, also looking into, into the suffering of things that you think might be pleasurable when they're actually suffering. You have that whole whipalasa thing going on. And it's like uh, seeing the danger and the gratification and the escape in things is very useful when you're in, sort of um, examining dukkha. You can, can see okay, what do I like about somebody made me brownies as an early birthday present. They happen to be staying and it's my birthday's coming up pretty soon. So they made brownies and it's like looking at the, the gratification in the brownies. They're, they're very num yummy and I enjoy them and they smell really nice <laughs> and they look really nice. And then the danger in them is they're not really good for the body. I mean, eat too many and you have a stomach ache or gain weight or feel kind of sluggish after a sugar rush or something like that. There's also danger in these num yummy brownies. And then the escape. And something I really love about this escape bit, um, I learned from Ajahn Pasano, who's the, the now guiding elder of Abhayagiri Buddhist Monastery. Um, he, he started the monastery here in California, the big Ajahn Chah lineage monks monastery. And I was asking him, I feel like there should be some kind of pat answer for this escape thing. Like what is the, is there like an overarching escape from all of this? And he's like, yeah, of course. And I was like, what is it? I need it. <laughs> and he, he's like, it's letting go. And I'm like, oh, duh <laughs> of course <laughs> i'm clinging it's always letting go <laughs> clinging to the gratification of things is the the answer is always the same just let go of whatever it is you're clinging to whatever gratification that is and you do that by seeing the danger in it so yeah i like those things as reflections um in meditation but also in everyday life as we're walking around we can sort of look at things like brownies or, you know, um, I don't know, whatever hobbies we might enjoy. There's always some downside somewhere. It's expensive. You're sore afterwards, you know, whatever the danger in things are that we're clinging to. It's good to examine. I think that's all I got, Rob. Sorry. No, that's good. <laughs> that's what I was looking okay. for. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's not a question. It's a little snippet. Um, in uh, when whenever there is a um, dhamma talk in in Sri Lanka, uh, there is a before the dhamma talk, the the monk will tell uh, an invitation to the heavenly beings to come and listen. So it's a kind of a practice that they're having. So. Yeah, I kind of noticed it's only happening in Sri Lanka. I think it is it was started by uh, Venerable Mahinda who brought the uh -uh. to Sri Lanka. Sorry, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but they in, in Thailand they usually reserve calling the devas for like ceremonies and then 
um, they'll give a Dhamma talk within that too, but we don't do it so much. Um, at least they don't at a Bayagiri and Amaravati and Chithurst if it's just a sort of regular Dhamma teaching. Um, they usually reserve that for bigger ceremonies and stuff. And I don't know why, because I think it's really nice to invite the devas to come here. <laughs> Maybe we should start doing it here out in the forest where they're probably hanging around. Thanks for sharing, Minori. Sorry for all the weird internet stuff. Thank you very much for being here with us, Aya. Okay, thank you. For your wonderful talk and okay. for all of your generosity in answering our questions. Yeah. Thank you for the good questions and the invitation. Um, yeah, it's always nice in the group. I enjoy the serious practitioner, the serious practitioners here. You don't see it all the time in, in different groups, so it's very sweet to have um, dedicated and devoted people yep, supporting each other. <laughs> okay. We're very lucky to have Sorry? you come teach us. So thank you. Aww. <laughs> sure, happy to. <laughs> okay, have a good evening. Good night. Have a good day yourself. <laughs> okay, bye. bye. <laughs>